You, you know, I had to put these glasses on. I, I don't see very well right now. There are five things wrong with this eye. And, and, and so significant that Monday I'm having eye surgery. And so if you have an eye you need to donate for the transplant, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> You're so happy right now, you'd probably give me one of them. So. <laughs> and, and you know, last chapel, as we're working through the series on the, in the book of Judges, we saw that the people of, in the book of Judges, they also had eyesight problem. We saw in the last verse in Judges that everyone was doing what was right in his own eyes. And then what seemed right in their own eyes, however, was absolutely sinful, absolutely wrong in the eyesight of someone else. And so we saw in the December chapel, I think it was, we're in that first part of chapter 3, verse 7, it says, Israel, the, the people in the, book of, in the book of Judges, they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Well, in, in the whole point we're making as we go through this book of Judges, there are two points. Number one is, what was true in the book of Judges then is true in our country today. Not just our country, but in the world. This is what's happened since the last time we met at chapel. I think I was with you January 18th or 19th. So it's been six, seven weeks. In the last few weeks, I put a picture of three big events. Dr. Larry Nasser. He was the one convicted in the sexual abuse of the gymnast, the female gymnast, in the Olympics. Since then, the accu he's already convicted. He's going to prison for the rest of his life. But the accusation soared to well over a hundred young ladies. Was he doing what was right in his own eyes? Probably. Was he doing what was right in the eyes of God? Absolutely not. That next the picture on the right, that's... That's just a picture of what took place Valentine's Day down in Parkland, Florida, with the fourth largest school shooting in our nation's history. The first being like 80 or 90 years ago. It's nothing new. It's just more frequent today. But what's really bothering me, and perhaps because today's the anniversary, it's the seventh anniversary of the war, or what I call wars in Syria. I call it wars because there's civil warfare going on, there's ethnic warfare going on, there's nation, different nations coming in and fighting, and there's different religious groups fighting. I mean, it's very complicated what's going there. It's not simple at all. But today is marked seven years of warfare. Of the 20 million people that live in Syria, 5 million have left the country. Another 5 million are displaced within the country. 8.6 million children are in dire need of assistance. One third of all the houses have been obliterated. One half of all the hospitals and one half of all the educational facilities. It's a mess. And each one of these people that are fighting are perhaps doing what's right in their own eyes. But it's not right in the eyes of God. So you and I need to be less like the people in the book of Judges, and we need to step up and change the way the world looks. We need to be like the leaders in the book of Judges. So here's what we've learned so far. The first judge. Now all these are from Judges chapter 3. Othniel, he was the first judge. We found that he was led and empowered by the Holy Spirit. He overcame Cusherishathiam, or Thiam the king of the Mesopotamians. God used him to change the way their world looked at that point in time. But a lot of us refuse to step up and allow the Holy Spirit to fill us with this power for one reason. It's because of fear. We're afraid to appropriate his power. But not the next judge. When we get to around verse 12 and goes to about verse 30, we have Ehud. He was fearless. Fear is the opposite of faith. So I like to say he had fearless faith. Three times, verse 16, verse 19, verse 27, when he's sharpening his, his he's making this 18-inch, one-cubit, two-edged sword, and he's contemplating assassinating King uh, Eglon, the king of the Moabites, he's probably thinking, what on earth am I doing? But God had called him to change the way his world looked. God had called him to save Israel. Verse 19, 
He turns around from the idols of Gilgal, and he goes back to take this secret message from God to King Eglon, because that's when he's going to be alone, and he can stab him. And then when they're in the hill country, and he gathers together the people of Israel, he calls the sons of Israel, and he says, charge. He doesn't send the people into battle. He leads the people into battle. He's up front. He's probably thinking as he's running like, I picture this scene in Braveheart. He's running there to go take them on. He's saying, wait, wait, wait. The other's still back there. Okay, let's go. Tempted by fear, but not controlled by fear. He reminds me, his fearlessness reminds me so much of Abigail Cotton. Abigail, where are you? Uh, I see all the things. Okay, Abigail, she's the one with her hand. Okay, there you are. All right. Now, you, you know, Abigail is special friends with Micah McCoy. And <laughs> so, I mean, did anybody not know that? All right, so here, here one, two, two, three weeks ago, Micah and Kyle Jones. Kyle's over here. Raise your hand, Kyle, our, our fearless president. He, the two of them and I, we're, we're spending time in this intense mentoring relationship. We're learning this, this one Saturday morning about the character qualities of diligence and endurance, and we're really getting close to God. And Abigail checks in on Micah, and he says, what are you doing? Well, I'm with uh, Dr. Jones, and, and we're spending the morning together. And, and she goes, she, she says, she doesn't say, tell him I said hello. She doesn't say, tell Dr. Jones or Chancellor Jones or Mr. Jones, I said hello. She says, tell Big Bill, I said hello. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's not. Tell Big Billy, I said hello. <laughs> Abigail? <laughs> yeah, yes, yes or no? Now, if you see her making a double-edged sword, let me know, okay? <laughs> and, and no, Debbie Germany, if she calls and says, I have a secret message from God, I need to tell Big Billy, uh, don't, don't set up the appointment, okay? Fearless, fearless. Well, you may say, this is where we left off last chapel. Oh, it's easy to be fearless when you have an army, or it's easy to be fearless when you're separated by distance from a phone. It's easy to be fearless... <clears throat> When you have this army behind you, but not so with the next judge. Now we come to Shamgar, chapter 3, verse 31. And it says, after him, the him there in verse 31 is referring to Ehud. After Ehud came Shamgar, son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad. And he also changed the way the world looks. He saved Israel. Now, I don't have an ox goad. I, this is about the closest I could find. I, I, I got this, it's a spear, <laughs> but it's, it's half of an ox goad. See, an ox goad had two parts. It had a sharp point. Tyler, come here, let me demonstrate. Um, <laughs> just teasing. Um, you use this part to kind of goad, that's another word for motivate, the ox and the oxen to keep going. So we're look, let's put it in second gear, you know. All right, need to put it in third gear. And so they, they kind of speed up. The other part was rounded, and so the blade on the plow, which is a plowshare, they would take that and beat the clay or the, the roots, whatever was clogging up the blade, they'd loosen it. Well, a lot of the pictures, what do you do with this? Um, a lot of the pictures on the internet about Shamgar look like this. They show him taking on all 600 at one time. I don't think that's the way it happened. The reason I don't, because it doesn't mention some kind of king like Cushurishatham or, or Eglon. It, it just says he he wiped out, struck down 600 Philistines. I think he did it more like this next picture. I think it went something like this. 
he comes home late one night from working in the, in the fields, and, and he washes his hands, sits down for dinner, and his, Mrs. Shamgar says, you know, I was at the well this evening, and the Philistines are once again sending raiding parties. They, they stole the lamp for sheep. They burned down Dean Swift's crops. You be careful out there, Shammy. That, that was kind of a term of endearment. So he goes to bed that night and he goes, God, would you raise up somebody who's going to make a difference and change all this suffering? We, we, want, we want to worship you freely. We want to follow you. But these Philistines, they're making it hard. Well, the next day he's back, he's at work. And he takes a break at lunch and he pulls out a bagel and he's sitting by a tree. And he looks over and he sees there's two or three Philistines headed his way. They don't see him because he's sitting down eating a snack. And so he backs behind a tree and it's, it, he can make a little bit of noise because there's a creek running behind him. And he goes, oh, no, I forgot my ox goat. So he reaches around the tree, pulls it back, and he's standing behind the tree, trying not to breathe, trying to be very quiet. And the three Philistines come up, and it's, it's lunchtime, so they, they eat their lunch. They say, well, maybe some water. So one of them comes behind the tree, and there's, you know, Shamgar. And not thinking, he, he takes and he <laughs> sticks him. Well, he kind of lets out a yell. So the other two come around, and he goes, pow, pow. And he, he's, he's wiped out all three. He goes home that night. Mrs. Shamgar says, how did they go? And he says, well, I encountered a few bumps in the road, but everything's fine. She goes, well, you know, there were some other Philistines took care of some neighbors' crops again today. So he goes to bed that night. He says, God, would you raise up somebody? And the Holy Spirit says, I have. So when Mrs. Shamgar's asleep, he sneaks out. He finds the campfire. Mrs. Shamgar doesn't know about it, but he gets pretty good with his ox goat. So he says, you know, Mrs. Shamgar, I want you to be ready in case I'm out in the fields. So he starts giving her lessons with a spare ox goat. Well, one day he's gone, and she's having a dinner party. And about five Philistines crash the party. She was pretty, not nearly as good as, he, as Mr. Shamgar. So after a while, the general, the Philistines going, what is going on? We've lost a hundred of our guys. Find that Hebrew and wipe him out. So they start looking for him. But he'd sneak out at night. He'd start dressing in black so he's kind of more hidden. And he starts wiping out two here, three there, five there. It reaches 200. The general's going nuts. It reaches 300. A legend comes up. He says he's quick as a cat. He reaches 400, 500. He begins, this legend starts. And he says, this guy, he's quick as a cat. And he's dressing in black. And they nicknamed him Black Panther. <laughs> when it finally got to 600, they said, he's unbeatable. And the Philistines left. And the scribe wrote chapter 3, verse 31. And after Ehud was Shamgar, son of Anath. And he struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad. And he also saved Israel. So what do we learn from Shamgar? He used what he had, and he did what he could. Now, in this series, I want you to learn, I want you to learn some characteristics from these leaders because I want you to be like these leaders and make a difference in the way the world looks. I want you to be like Othniel, and I want you to be men and women of power, Holy Spirit power. I want you to be like Ehud, and I want you to have fearless faith. So when God speaks to you, and the Holy Spirit says, I will fill you, but you must, must appropriate it by faith, and this is what I'm going to do to use you. And then I want you to be men and women of action. God's gifted each one of us with some kind of ox go. 
Now, I don't know what your ox goat is, but I know what my ox goat is. It's a simple ox goat. It's not very well beautifully adorned. There's some fancy ox goats. But the ox goat God's given me is very powerful. It's called the gospel. Three weeks ago, it's World Christian Week. I'm sitting where I normally sit, and the clock hadn't started counting down. Actually, they didn't turn it on or something was broke. So he was waiting on that to count down, but it was way past time. And I had the chance to share the gospel at lunch with my youngest son, one of his coworkers. And so I slipped out. I felt very, I was embarrassed because I didn't want to be a bad example. And we go to the table and I share the gospel with him. And my son adds to it and the, says, is there anything keeping you from crossing over right now? And the gospel had so convicted his heart, he said, no. I said, you want to go out in my car and pray to receive Christ? He goes, no, I want to do it right here. There are uh, servers walking up and down. There's a table right beside us that can hear every word we're saying. And he prays and he invites Jesus into his heart. And now he and another fellow co-worker that my son and I led to Christ two months ago, the two of them are in Bible study now. The next day. After Bible study during lunch, I go down to USC and a 22-year-old young man whose uncle I'd used my ox goat on four years ago. His uncle had prayed to receive Christ. His uncle says, you need to talk to this fellow at CIU. So I meet him downtown right, just right beside USC, and I take my ox goat, and I poked him just a little bit. And he said, I want that. My sister has that. My uncle has that. I don't have it, and I want it. I want it now. And he prayed and invited Jesus into his heart. He checks in with me every Sunday night about what scripture he's reading and how he's growing. He's three weeks old in the Lord. That night, I drove up to Clinton. Although they say, I'm saying it wrong. It says Clinton. So I went to Clinton. Seven adults invited me to come up there to teach them what it means to be born again. So I got on. We met at a restaurant. I got on top of the table, and I was doing this, and... <laughs> <clears throat> and I poked seven of them. Not one except to Christ then, but this is a powerful ox goat that God's given me. So, for example, Friday, I went, that same week, I went and met with a guy I'd shared, I had poked earlier at Mr. Bunky's on 378 going to Sumter. And we talked, and he prayed to receive Christ in September, a year and a half after he was poked with the ox goat. But now he's different. And every Sunday night, he checks in with me about how he's growing, what scripture he's learning. This is my ox. Well, the gospel, the gospel's my ox goat. Now, I don't know what your ox goat is. I just wrote down some, just some possibilities. Is it teaching? Is it faith? Is it leadership? Is it vision, mercy, singing? I know my ox goat is not singing. Now, if it is singing, that doesn't mean I'm going to change the world by singing. But I can tell you this, if it's not singing, I can tell you that you're not going to change the world by singing. Not positively anyway. We can learn a lot how God wants to use us by knowing what kind of ox goat he's given us. Is it making money? You business organizational leadership students, listen, if God's gifted you at making money, you go make as much money as you possibly can. Make a lot. Save a lot. Give a lot. Don't spend a lot on yourself. Spend it on the kingdom. Send half of it back to CIU for scholarship money. Is it, are you an intercessor? What ox goat has he given you? I'm reading this, I'm mentoring, just started mentoring eight men. It's a once a month thing, and we're, we're studying a certain topic every, every month. They read a book, do a project, memorize some verses. We get together and we discuss it. And, and this month it's on purpose. And so the assignment is read the Purpose Driven Life, the book, Purpose Driven Life. And last night, because, you know, I need to read what I've asked them to read. So last night I'm reading it. It's a chapter on where Rick Warren talks about God has shaped each one of us. S-H-A-P-E. He's given certain spiritual gifts, certain heart or passion. My passion lies in church planting. That's why I came here is to mobilize generations to go change the way the world looks. Abilities. 
a certain personality. So if God's gifted you with evangelism, you're introverted, that may look a whole lot different than if he's giving you the gift of evangelism, the ox goat of evangelism, and you're introvert. It may look different, your personality and your experiences. Now, who's going to help? Who can minister to someone who's coming from an unchurched, non-Christian, dysfunctional family better than somebody who comes from an unchurched, non-Christian, dysfunctional family? But that A, abilities, God's given each one of you. Each one of you has an ability. Each one of you has a spiritual gift. Each one of you has an ox go that God's given you that you can use to make a difference. So like Shamgar, use what you have and do what only you can do. But start right now. Start right here. So what do we learn from Shamgar this morning that we can add to our list? If Othniel was a man of power, the Holy Spirit came upon him, filled him with power. And Ehud was a man of faith, fearless, pick a bell of cotton kind of faith. That's kind of my pet name for you, Abigail. I'm just going to start calling you pick a bell. <laughs> then I challenge you to be men and women of action. Men and women of power, men and women of faith, men and women of action. Take your ox goad. Start right here. Start right now. Use that unique ability, and let's go out and change the way our world looks. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Lord, thank you that we have such a great fellowship community on campus. Thank you for the love that we have for one another. Thank you that we're close. Lord, thank you this is an awesome school that you, that the uh, accreditors um, recognized that and communicated that. Father, there are a lot of exceptional young people that are on this campus. And Father, I pray that you would prepare them as they're being educated from a biblical worldview. Father, that you would show them clearly what your power is capable of. Father, I pray that you'd show them that they're only limited by their faith. That you're ready to fill them, to use them, if they'll just trust you. And then, Father, I pray that you clearly show them how you've gifted them, how you've shaped them, what abilities you've given them. So motivated out of a love for people, and a desire for you to receive our hallelujah. They would go out and make a difference in the way our world looks. Father, use them in a powerful way, please. Right here, right now. In Jesus' name, amen.